Hi, I'm Brad Power, and this is the Cancer Patient Lab. This is our weekly webinar series. Today, we're honored to have Bert Rosen with us. Bert is a multidimensional uh, patient advocate, survivor. He's got a story to tell about how he's managed his own care. Um, we've been friends for a long time. I think from even before he he kind of got all of his diagnoses and and on it, went on his treatment journey. Um, he, he's based in Portland, Oregon, where, where I have family, and so I've spent a fair amount of time. Uh, so quickly, the three housekeeping items we always do at the front end. First of all, this is uh, for information purposes only. We're just sharing medical advice with you. Yeah, you to your computer. Medical team. Uh, okay, I'll mute that. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, anyway, this is for information and, and uh, not for, it's not medical advice. Second is uh, this will be made public. Uh, so if you're concerned about your image or your name or anything you say being made public, you're welcome to turn off your camera, change your name and not say anything. Um, and then finally, we are a, a patient led nonprofit and we depend on the kindness of members and friends who donate money and so if you're interested in donating money please do so which you can do through our website with that i'll turn it over to bert who's got some slides the share screen should be working bert and uh, uh take it away all righty um well thank you and and thanks so sorry i just want to set up the okay you could all see that right yep Okay. So um, first of all, thanks for introducing me and thanks for having me. Like, I'm really flattered that you, that you even asked if I would do this. Um, it's probably helpful if I introduce myself for 30 seconds, just so you have some context. So um, I live in Portland, Oregon. I'm from New York City. I'm a, one of those rare native New Yorkers that don't really exist anymore. Um, I, uh, like I said, I live in Portland, Oregon. I've been in marketing my whole life, my whole career. Um, my passion is is smaller and middle-sized companies or places that I can make a real difference in the world. Uh, and then two years ago, I got diagnosed, and I'll go through that, some of that stuff in a minute. Um, I'm actually, uh, I have a very strange sense of humor, so I hope I don't offend anyone. But um, I like to say that I went to the cancer store on buy one, get one free day. So I have two primary cancers. I have a renal clear cell carcinoma, which is a kidney cancer for those who don't know. And then the other thing I have is called a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors are, are much less common cancers uh, that can originate in a bunch of places, but it's basically a cancer of the endocrine system. And mine originated in the pancreas, spread to the liver, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, the last thing I'll tell you quickly is that, um, as Brad alluded to, I spend a ton of time in the integrative oncology world. So one of the ways I feel better is by volunteering. So I volunteer a lot. Uh, I volunteer a lot in integrative oncology because I believe that it's it could help so many people and so many people just aren't aware. So um, I'm married. I have two grown kids out of the house who both live in LA and a small dog. So I just want to give you a little bit of context of, of who I am. So um, I'm going to, you know, I put together a, a few slides. I'm going to go fairly quickly because I know we want to have more time for conversation than, than Bert talking. And if I'm boring, you could always just say, hey, Bert, you're boring. Move on. I don't get offended. Like, it's really hard to offend me. I mean, let's be honest, right? We all have cancer. If somebody calls me boring, who cares? It's, 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 it's my perspective has changed quite a bit. So, um, okay. So he, here's my story. Uh, and I'll, again, try to keep it brief. So I got diagnosed in July of 22. I had been, um, I, I also have chronic Lyme disease. And I had a horrible brain fog episode. My health had been declining for a while. So I was at a conference, a healthcare conference in Boston in uh, May of 22 and had a horrific episode of brain fog. I couldn't text anyone. I couldn't email anyone. If I tried to FaceTime, they knew something was wrong with me. Um, flew home the next day, left the conference, flew home the next day, obviously. I, if I was smarter, I would have walked into a hospital because I could have been having a stroke. But flew home the next day. Um, took the next couple of months, kind of got out of my brain fog, then I relapsed, went to the hospital in July, <clears throat> got admitted for ammonia buildup in my brain and for internal bleeding. And then when you get admitted for internal bleeding, because it's serious, they, um, 
scan you all over the place. And that's when they found my two cancers. Uh, so I was in the hospital for about two weeks. The, the first priority for me there was to stop the bleeding. Um, my wife and I kind of had a strategy we laid out, which was phase one was just stop the bleeding because that could immediately cause death. Phase two is worry about cancer. So um, in July for two weeks, I was in the hospital. Uh, I, like I said, I was strange sense of humor. So of course we had to do some stupid things in the hospital, like put googly eyes on the urine bottle. Um, then uh, I left the hospital and it was time for phase two to start focusing on my cancer. So for those, uh, I, I'm going to assume people don't know if, if I'm wrong, tell me and then I'll go at a higher level, but neuroendocrine tumors, like I said, it's an uncommon cancer. So they found, uh, tumors in my liver and my pancreas and in my kidney. Um, so because my neuroendocrine tumor was metastatic, it was already in my liver and there's some other spots, they decided to go after that one more aggressively. So the, the scan you get, or one of the scans, I get CTs, MRIs, et cetera, but uh, we also get PET scans with a specific kind of tracker called Dotatate, which is a radioactive tracker that uh, activates receptors on the outside of the neuroendocrine cells. So, um, so once I got out of the hospital in July, I then found an oncologist at OHSU, which is the hospital I go to in Portland, and they ordered the Dotatate PET scan, and that's my Dotatate PET scan. So pretty much everything in black is what's referred to as Dotatate AVID, which means that the receptors light up due to the tracker. So um, illustrations of spots that could become cancerous. So, uh, but then I had my diagnosis, right? I had my diagnosis, I started on, uh, an oral chemotherapy agent called capacetabine and temozolomide, which is a pretty common protocol for neuroendocrine for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And um, it was great. I did it for seven months. It was all oral and at home, so nothing, no infusions. Uh, it was pretty mild. Like some of my symptoms got a little worse, but I didn't really get new symptoms from the chemo. Uh, and I did it for seven months until my blood levels dropped to, my platelet levels dropped too low and I was well below 100. I think it was close to 75. And my doctor said, okay, we have to pull you off chemo. Now the next option is surgery. Um, but after I got the diagnosis, then I started, I, I, I believe that knowledge for me is power. So I started to learn as much as I could. And this is a photo of one of the neuroendocrine support groups at a dinner in New York City. So I started to go to every support group I could find, read everything I could find, I've changed a lot since then, but it was a, it was a great way for me to learn as much as I could about my condition and people who went through it. Um, so then I was on a scan schedule of roughly every, uh, at the time, I think it was one to two months. Uh, and in one of my, they do two scans for me. And one of my scans is my abdomen, which they do with contrast and, uh, my chest, which they do without contrast. So, uh, in this month, which was March, they've they um, found a nodule in my lungs. And then they thought that I had actually three primary cancers, uh, which would have made me extremely unique. But um, they couldn't biopsy it because of the location and the size. So they recommended, because I had other primaries, that they just remove it, because that way, if it had been malignant, at least it was gone. And if it was benign, at least we knew it. So my doctor could treat me uh, not having to worry about that. So I had lung surgery in April. Um, they, after my lung surgery, they told me I was going to have to have a liver resection because I came off of the chemo. Um, but I decided that there are things in my life that were more important. And my daughter was graduating college. So I said to them, I'm not going to do the surgery for three months. And they said, okay, we'll give you some injections to hold you over for three months and then we'll do the surgery. So I got to go to my daughter's graduation, which was pretty amazing. And I think one of the themes for me that you'll see a fair amount is that uh, even though I'm living with this crap inside me, I'm still trying to enjoy my life every way I can. So then after my daughter graduated, hopefully no one's too squeamish, <laughs> um, I had my liver resection. So this is in June of 23. Um, I asked my surgeon to take pictures of what they took out of me because I was curious. This is him holding the left lobe of my liver, which they had to remove. They removed the left lobe and 17 tumors out of the right lobe. Uh, at my gallbladder. They were actually supposed to re remove my spleen and my pancreas, but I lost too much blood. But in any case, so I had the liver resection in June. Um, if anybody wants more tumor pictures, let me know. I'm happy to share them. Um, one of the, the lessons I learned here was really valuable is uh, a lot of people, 
I don't know if you found this or if you think this way, but a lot of people in the cancer world just want to get it out of them as fast as possible. And I have friends who are like this too. And I had this liver resection in June and the surgery itself, they couldn't do everything they wanted, but the liver stuff, which is the most important, they did and, and thought they made good progress. But I came out and as I was in recovery, um, they realized that nobody had capped my IV. So I got a bunch of air in my bloodstream. They had to they had to reintubate me after I was already in recovery for about a day and a half. They had to scan my brain to make sure I wasn't having a stroke. They had to scan my heart to make sure I wasn't having a heart attack. Uh, and it was all because somebody made a mistake. Um, the only reason why I wanted to bring this up is because a lot of people will say to me, like, I, my doctor told me I'm inoperable. I'm so upset. Or they told me the surgery is up to me. And I just want people to remember that the, the surgery might be able to help cure your specific condition or help with your specific condition, but there's a lot of risks that are involved in surgery too that nobody ever thinks about when they're making these decisions. So that's why I bring that up there. Um, like I said, I like to enjoy myself and try to live life. So this was probably not my smartest move, but three months almost to the day after my liver surgery, I decided to go to an integrative oncology conference in Banff and Banff is an 11 hour drive from Portland. But if I went to Glacier where I've never been, it adds only two or three. So I took a 10 day, 1800 mile solo road trip, including camping and hiking by myself in Glacier, three months after my liver surgery. So what I would say is probably not the world's smartest move. Um, I'd probably do it again because I'm not that smart, but, uh, but it was really important for me to be able to have something to look forward to. So did that did some polar bear plunge stuff with people. Um, the reason why I showed this, and hopefully this doesn't cause more stress to people than most of our health, but we had a couple of leaks develop in our ceiling and it was extremely stressful, like, right? You're dealing with your health and then your house has issues. But one of the things that kind of just always reminded me is like life goes on, right? Like life, like somebody said to me, once you get diagnosed with cancer, there should be a deal you never get diagnosed with anything else. And it's like, yeah, I kind of agree with that across the board, right? Once you get cancer, you should never have a leak in your ceiling in your house. Um, but that doesn't work, right? So this stuff happens. So it, it does keep me grounded a little bit that I do focus on how life goes on around me. And then this year, uh, because like I said, I'm an idiot and I like to enjoy myself. On my two year anniversary, I jumped out of an airplane. Um, I had never done it before. I like to scare the crap out of myself. I like to push myself. I kind of feel like if I'm not doing some kind of stupid things that scare me a little bit, like I'm not, you know, keeping myself as interested as I could be, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my story pretty quickly. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, the treatments that I have, like I said, seven rounds of oral chemo. Um, I get a shot every 28 days. It's called a somatostatin analog. That's more information if you need it or want it, just ask me later. I get scanned every three to four months now. I think one of the things that's also really important to me is Brad alluded to is all the integrative oncology things I do. So I do yoga. I'm very conscious of my diet. I try to walk and exercise when I can. I intermittent fast every day. Um, I know like there's science, there's, you can find science that says pretty much anything now, but I said to my naturopath once, like, what do you think about intermittent fasting? And she said, you know, you have a lot of issues going on with your organs. It's probably not a bad idea to give them some more rest. And it's like, oh, that actually makes a ton of sense. So, um, so I do stuff like that. Uh, I meditate every day. I do focus on my mindfulness and then I do a fair amount of writing, which I also find therapeutic. So it's always important to me that somebody, when somebody says, what treatments are you going through? Uh, that I don't just talk about the pills I take or the injections I get. So, um, so these are the things that I've learned. Uh, and this is where I'll, wrap up after, but in a lot of ways for me, cancer has been a gift. Um, I've been, I've learned to appreciate life. I've learned to appreciate everything and everybody much more. I figured out the things I don't appreciate and I've cut them out of my life as well as I can. Um, so I've grown a ton as a human being. So despite the fact that of course, nobody wants to have cancer, um, I definitely personally have had some silver linings coming out of it. Uh, the next one is that the, you know, one thing I learned really early when I joined all those support groups is there's a ton of focus on the world in treatment, right? So you can, like the first support group I went to, it was me who had just been diagnosed within a month or two and a whole bunch of people who had had the disease for over 15 years. And the big discussion was what kind of gel do they put on their butt? Before they go, 
the, what kind of gel do they put on their butt before they get their injection? And it was like, I don't even yeah. know what the injection is. Okay. I don't know how to tell my mom I have cancer, right? And I started to realize that there's kind of this big divide between the living with cancer part and financial and family and relationships and all the other thing and the treatment part. So I never want to shortchange the experience part. So it's something I actually focus on a fair amount and I blog and it's some of the integrative stuff is there too. Um, I will never ever call myself a cancer patient. Uh, I'm very uh, focused that I am who I am and I happen to have cancer. Uh, I'll tell people that I'm burnt who happens to have cancer, like I have eczema or allergies. Um, I don't let uh, calling myself a cancer patient, um, I feel like it defines me. And I know words are a big topic of conversation in this world, but for me, it's very important that that's how I look at myself. Um, I did this for fun the other day. So my treatment is I get an injection once every 28 days. So I tried to figure out what percent of my 28 days is that treatment. And, you know, when I realized it, like, I think it's three quarters of a percent of a month, I, I get an oncology treatment. So it, it also gave me some more perspective on how like the other 99.925% of my month, I can be focused on ways to take care of my body and do other different types of things. So it, it was important for me to kind of understand, you know, we put all of this emphasis on the medical side of treatment, but living life is a much bigger percentage of your time. Um, the other thing, the other things that I would really talk about here, the just two things quickly. So one is my ICDI and IWDI. Um, ICDI stands for I can do it and IWDI stands for I will do it. And those are things that um, I found it's really, really important for me to plan things for myself that I have to look forward to and to prove to myself that I can do things. So jumping out of an airplane was a good example, right? Um, I wasn't that nervous, but you know, you're jumping out of an airplane, right? But I did it and I was so proud of myself that I did it and I looked up to it. I, I was excited about doing it before I prepped mentally and all the other stuff. So like having that thing to look forward to that was going to scare me and then memories that I can take coming out of it are really, really important. So that, like my Glacier National Park trip was one of those things that I would put in that category. And then the last thing I would say quickly is just the one day at a time thing. I know it's used a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous, but when I was in the hospital for my initial, uh, when I initially got diagnosed, like we spent a lot of focus on one day at a time, right? Like it's very easy to think about, well, what's gonna happen if my scan in eight months isn't good? It's like, well, you know what, let's set a goal for today and get through today and not worry about things you can't control about in, in the long term. So those are just some of the things I've taken away. I mean, like, I don't want to talk anymore. The other slides I have in here, which uh, you'll see on the video or Brad can share if he wants, there's nothing private. These are some of the resources I have um, that I use. I blog a lot. So that links to all resources is a link to my resource page on my blog where there's um, a stuff uh, about neuroendocrine tumors, stuff about kidney cancer, integrative oncology, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's my contact info if anybody wants to get a hold of me. Uh, there's my email. I do run two Facebook groups for people with neuroendocrine tumors. One in Portland, which you could actually see, that's my logo in the bottom right corner. Um, one for people in the Portland or connected to the Oregon area who have neuro neuroendocrine tumors. And then one uh, that's uh, actually has members from all over the world, uh, which isn't location specific, but there's a lot of politics in cancer. And I kind of wanted to set up communities for people who didn't want to deal with politics. So um, with that, I'm eight minutes over. Actually, I'm probably not eight minutes over, but I'll stop talking. <clears throat> Thanks, Bert. Um, I'll get us started, and then if people have comments or questions, you can use the raise hand feature or the chat mm -hmm. to raise them. Um, let me just pick up, because you mentioned the neuroendocrine aspect here. Uh, neuroendocrine uh, came up in, uh, by the way, could you uh, go back to stop the screen share? Um, sure. uh, neuroendocrine came up in prostate cancer for our friend Amit Ghatani and Brian also, I think, had some indication from his Boston Gene research of neuroendocrine. We've had connections with the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation, which is one of the ones you mentioned. Um, Brian, any questions or comments about neuroendocrine that you would have for Bert? Um, I, I don't, um, you know, for, for, for better or for worse, um, you know, my my cancer is not pathologically displaying neuroendocrine disease. And so I'm not really looking at it that way right now. Um, 
So, uh, Bert, just uh, to help you understand, you know, I, I had a multi-omic uh, analysis done by Boston Gene where they looked at my genomics and my transcriptomics and then did a whole bunch of other stuff. <laughs> um, and I did have uh, a higher than normal expression of synaptophysin. Um, and so that could be a precursor for neuroendocrine disease. I've been battling this for eight years, um, but um, but it's, it's not showing up in pathology. Um, and so... Um, uh, that's an interesting finding in and of itself, right? You know, how do you relate what you're getting from transcriptomics uh, to what you're seeing actually, um, you know, in the lab under the microscope? Um, but uh, but I know it's a, it's a it's it's one that you don't want, um, and uh, I know it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, but um, right now, I'm not I'm not treating it that way. That makes sense. Um, and you know, I mean, if it's not a type that a lot of people know anything about. So if anybody on the phone knows anyone who's dealing with it or hears of anybody who knows someone who's dealing with it and you want a connection for them, like you can feel free to give anyone my email address. I try to, I like talking to people and try to help people every time I can. But Brian, I'm sorry, Brian, one last thing just to say to you. So um, the good thing about neuroendocrine is people live a really long, people, they can live a really long, like I know people who've lived in, you know, over 30 years since diagnosis. Um, mm. Not everyone does, obviously, but some do. So it's it's not, um, it's serious, of course. And by the time they diagnose most of them, they're already stage four, like mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but uh, it's fairly indolent. Uh, and it grows, but... If I Emma? Can we add the transformation of prostate cancer to neuroendocrine phenotype? It's it's really bad because it's high grade. Bird is treated with landriotide. Right. Of course, kind of unusual that he received chemotherapy first, but the the disease was very widespread. So there must have been a reason for that. So and as Bert mentioned, the uh the grade was probably one or two, in spite of the cancer being highly metastatic and Again, as Bert mentioned, this is completely different. Treatment paradigm is very different for low-grade neuroendocrine cancer. I'm um, also interested, um, maybe I missed something because I didn't join right away. You mentioned that you had clear cell RCC, mm -hmm. and that was simply removed? No, they, they don't want to treat the clear cell because... Uh, really? I mean, you know, to treat kidney, they have to remove either do partial or radical nephrectomy. And yeah. they're worried if they do that because of the risks inherent, they could screw up the treatment for the neuroendocrine, which is the more serious. So wow. for, for right now, they're not doing anything. Um, I do, you know, just as a human being, like the one, I, I'm not worried about the neuroendocrine. I have teams of people looking at that, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm terrified. I go get a scan one day and somebody goes, oh, your kidney tumor grew or spread. Like that scares me. I see. Because they're not doing anything about it. Because I work with a patient who, early enough, had precisely the same two cancers as you do. There's a syndrome called von Hippo Lindau. No, he doesn't have it. Okay. Yeah, I don't have it either. Even but though he. Yeah. Both present. Do you have it? No, I tested negative too. Did you have molecular uh, analysis, mutational analysis of tumor? I, so the hospital I go to is called uh, OHSU in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. So they did genomic testing on me and they came back and said I didn't have any mutations that they picked up. That's fairly typical, yeah. It's yeah. the same situation as for the other patients that I work with. I, I would love to get a better genomic analysis than OHSU, uh, like from Tempest or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I tried to do it through Tempest, but I didn't have enough tissue. I might but know. it's it's also quite often that neuroendocrine tumors do not have a lot of mutation or yeah. any mutations that can be pinpointed as triggers of cancer. So this segues to a question Chris Apple raised in the chat. Chris, I don't know if you want to just um, say it uh, on audio here, asking about which testing company. Yeah, so um, to give you some background, Bert, um, so I'm the founder and CEO of SageMedic. So we have a um, functional profiling platform. We can actually create microtumors from a patient biopsy within uh, a day and then have a test result within seven to 10 days. 
um, and uh, and so we are actually the opposite of was what I would like to say organoid research does or PDX models do. I, I saw that there is this connections or relationship with, with PDX. Um, and so the functional profiling very often overcomes the limitations of genomic testing. But that said, it's not that there is one size fits all and there's just one thing that is, is the right thing. Um, and therefore, I'm always looking at, and I'm dealing with a neuroendocrine cancer patient from um, the UK at this point, who actually nice. had a um, esophageal on the esophageal, esophageal junction, a tumor that was surgically removed stage two or two years ago. And now we have liver meds that were initially responding to treatment and have now been resistant and it's actually growing quite fast. And so um, we have done our sensitivity testing, but I also wanted to have, have this complemented with a good genomic and transcriptomic analysis. And there, I um, that's out of my space. <laughs> and so I'm interested in um, the, the your view or the, 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 the view of uh, this community um, for a, and it's a high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. It grows at roughly a millimeter a day. Oh, wow. Um, so that is relatively rapid. And so I would like to have a solution by yesterday. So, what, so um, it, is it a neuroendocrine tumor or is it a neuroendocrine carcinoma? Carcinoma. So, the, yeah, the neuroendocrine carcinomas will be different, right? Because they're much more aggressive. The carcinoma is much more aggressive than neuroendocrine tumors. There's, there's neuroendocrine carcinoma, uh, which is generally high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. And, neuro, and neuroendocrine tumors, they're two, yeah, two different. Yeah, it has adenobatous parts as well. Um, so he had a gastrectomy and uh, esophagectomy, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, the, the labs that I know, so Tempus, T-E-M-P-U-S, okay. they're, they're really good. Um, PanCan, for those who don't know, has a program called Know Your Tumor, where they have a deal with Tempus, and they'll actually get you genomic sequencing of your tumors for free, uh, for pancreatic tumors. And... Uh, whether it's neuroendocrine or the adenocarcinoma. Um, so they actually have this great program called Know Your Tumor, and they'll do it all for free. Um, I tried to do it, but, uh, I mean, hospital right. politics. You is said there wasn't enough tissue. Um, um, so how much tissue do they usually need? I think, it's, I think it's normal. I, my problem was that my biopsy was done at one hospital, then I started getting treated at a different hospital, and I'm right. not convinced the different hospital who treats me really wanted to deal with the paperwork of getting Tempest tissue samples. So I, I'm not convinced anybody went out of their way to make it happen. <laughs> okay. So I, I couldn't tell you how much tissue, but, but I don't think it's any, it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's what you would get out of a biopsy. Okay. You just need slides. I don't... You know, Rick, um, Tempest wants, uh, they want tissue. Um, I mean, the blood, I mean, liquid biopsy is a whole other topic, right? But I don't know that the genomics testing te uh, test from blood, I think it's generally tissue sample. But I, I'm not a mm -hmm. No, they, 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 they can do it from blood. Um, there's, there's things happening at OHSU, and we'll talk offline later, but um, I, don't, I, I would like to connect you to someone, but um, and I'll, I'll send you an email afterwards, and we'll talk. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, just going back to the Neuroendocrine uh, Tumor Research Foundation, when we spoke to them, they were interested in, they got a, um, uh, like a video series where they, they do interviews with patients and talk about neuroendocrine and oh. pancreatic cancer, neuroendocrine and prostate cancer, et cetera, just to sort of lay it out. And I know they wanted to talk to uh, Brian and Amit um, for an interview there. Brian, th did, that, did that just sort of not die out or something? Um, yeah, I've done a number of them. Um, and we actually, I, we, we did. Um, I don't think I ever saw the finished product though. So I'm not sure if it was ever published. Okay. We should probably follow up with them. Yeah. Is it Brad, is this somebody I introduced you to? Is it Jessica Thomas? Uh, I think we, we, we no, it's independent uh, and coincidental because again, uh, our 
former community member, Amit Katani, it was uh, very much focused on his neuroendocrine. And I forget, he was donating to them and then we connected with them and, and talked about collaboration. Okay. So coincidental. Um, so Bert, just one other thing. Um, I, I was remembering, I should have mentioned before, how I got to know you was through the Society for Participatory Medicine, where you were, I think you were president, right? A while, yeah, a while ago. A while ago. If you could just, maybe if, just to inform everyone here what the Society for Participatory Medicine is about, because it might be of interest. Sure. Um, so it was started, it was actually started a while ago. I don't know if people have ever heard of Dave DeBroncart. He also goes by ePatient Dave. He's probably one of the first Brad, would you agree? One of the first patient advocates, certainly one of the first e patient advocates. Yeah. yeah. Um, like amazing dynamic, amazing energy. Uh, so I had, I worked at a company called HealthSpark and we did pricing transparency for health plans. So we would ingest claims data and then show members your procedure could cost X. Uh, and we did some client summits and we had Dave DeBroncart and Danny Sands, who are co founders of Society for Participatory Medicine, come speak. And they're, they're all about, um, bringing an equal voice from the patient side and the caregiver side into healthcare. So uh, more about promoting how doctors should work with their patients and listen to their patients and, and a lot of that kind of stuff. It's been a while since I've been there. Um, so I'm not sure really all the stuff they're doing now. I, I focus, I do a lot of volunteering both in the neuroendocrine world now and uh, in the integrative oncology world. So I do a lot with Society for Integrative Oncology. Great. Um Rick Davis, you, you've had a couple of comments in the chat. You've had a couple of comments here. Anything more that you want to say? Well, Emma kind of said what I wanted to say, which is that um, neuroendocrine is a very big deal in prostate cancer because about 20% of men with advanced prostate cancer find that their treatment, uh, their cancer morphs to either a small cell uh, neuroendocrine-like tumor. So we deal with it a lot. We spent a lot of time talking about it this past Monday, if, if anybody wants to listen to the recording. Um, we, we, we try to identify it as early as possible. The, the, the big issue in, in prostate cancer is, is identifying and there's some really great research out there right now um, based on the expression of a protein called DLL3. Now, I suspect these are neuroendocrine carcinomas and not neuroendocrine tumors, but I don't actually know. I'd have to go back and look at the DLL3 research and see what it is into. But that DLL3 is um, being examined in the context of many neuroendocrine uh, cancer tumors, because one of the issues we've had is that there isn't sufficient product. And so people that we've referred to, Misha Beltran, uh, Dana Farber and Rahul Agarwal at UCSF, they haven't been able to get the test because there hasn't been enough product. And, um, but it, it, it it's a really, uh, for those men on here who do have advanced cancer, they've really got to be looking all the time to make sure that their cancer is not morphing. And, and one of the ways to do that is to compare um, a PSMA scan, which is very comparable to the Dotatate scan that Bert was talking about, um, to an FDG scan, um, because then you can see if your tumors are all expressing PSMA, um, or if some of them are not. And uh, neuroendocrine small cell tumors don't express PSMA. So they can change into a situation where they were, but they're not now. And if you see a difference between those two scans, you know you've got a problem. The key, as we understand it, we work closely with, um, with UCSF and especially their BRCA Research Institute, where they that they, they they deal quite a bit with NET is that if you can find the NET if you can find the NET early you can treat it 
um, and for the for the for the NET carcinomas, um, I think the preferred treatment is a platen. But I didn't see you got a platen, Bert. So that's why I think we're talking about a different type of tumor to your NET. But if you can catch it early, you can treat it. Um, yeah, I think most. I was just. I'll just finish. Most of the time, the GU medical oncologists don't look for it, and they don't catch it early. And that is for us it's a huge issue because that's why we lost um our dear um herb geller who um whose cancer morphed and his docs at nih and uh and hopkins just didn't catch it and they should have done thanks rick um i was going to call on roger royce if you don't mind roger with the intersection with the pancreatic cancer, is there anything that Bert said that um, you know you you had comments or questions about? Um, you know, one thing it's a question I always ask when I see this. Your slide went by kind of quickly. Sorry, um, I was trying no, to be yeah. fast. No, no, I, I, and we appreciate that. Uh, I'm just kind of curious about some of the other lifestyle choice changes that you made um, because I don't. I think that's more important than than maybe, you know, it's it's more fun to talk about all the pharmacology, I guess, but I think it's an important part, some of the other changes, if there were any. Were there, Bert? Yeah. So so I like so like I said, I, I volunteer a lot in the integrative oncology space. So I'm very active with Society for Integrative Oncology. I know a bunch of people at other integrative oncology organizations. And I think like one of the things so for, okay, I have to say this first, right? Because we are all 100% different and we react to things differently and we experience things differently. I am very, very lucky. Like I am very lightly, I mean, despite the fact that I have two primary cancers, one that's advanced, I'm very lightly symptomatic. So I pretty much do what I want. Um, that lets me, you know, I, I try to be as empathetic as I can because there's a lot of people who, who can't, right? But I, I always want to say that because I don't want to say things and and say, oh, wow, look how great I'm doing because of all this stuff. I'm just a different person, right? But um, I don't know, maybe that was a babble. But Roger, to answer your question, uh, you know, I think one of the things I learned early um, was I left my oncologist's office. It's like, okay, you're going to give me chemo, radiation, surgery, or immunotherapy, maybe a targeted therapy. Um, you know, but how do I take care of Bert, right? Like everything you're going to do for me is designed to kill the bad stuff inside me. Nothing is designed to take care of the good stuff inside me or help my body deal with the bad stuff you're killing. So that's how I got into the integrative oncology world. So um, I'm not hardcore by any means, but I focus a lot on like, I mean, this is an easy example. Every meal I eat now, I try to make sure I have vegetables in the meal. Um, my, I love junk food. Like I love junk food, but I, I try to limit myself a lot on junk food. And if I can eat healthier junk food, I try to eat healthier junk food. If I can be outside, I go outside. If I can take a walk, if the fatigue isn't too bad, if I can go take a walk, I'll go take a walk. Um, yoga, I was doing regularly until the studio I go to change stuff. So I have to get back into that. But yoga for me made me feel better every time I did it. Um, meditation has really helped a lot because it's really helped me stay grounded and it's let me not go into anxiety state or, you know, if I, like it's taught me so many, like if I go take a walk now, um, because I've been meditating for a while, like I'll start to be conscious of every foot placement and I'll try, like, I'll do that. Or if I'm in a crappy mood, like I'll go take a walk and I'll start asking myself, like, why am I in a crappy mood? And I'll start talking to myself to figure some of this stuff out. And, um, like I go to therapy once a week. So, uh, I do some supplement stuff, um, mostly vitamins. Uh, I do some iron supplements cause my ferritin is low and things like that too. But, uh, you know, I was a lot, I would do all the IO treatments I could do. Like I'm on Medicare now and Medicare, which is idiotic, doesn't cover acupuncture for anything other than chronic lower back pain. Um, but I was doing acupuncture every two weeks before I went on Medicare. So I, I'm a big believer in all of this stuff. I think um, the biggest points for me on the IO side are uh, one that they can help my mental health too. And the stronger I am mentally, the stronger I feel physically. Um, and the more I feel like I can overcome everything. Uh, and I think um, there's no harm, right? Like th there's no, nothing, 
like because I meditate, I'm not doing it. There's no possibility of doing any damage to myself. So if it could help me, why not take the risk? So, you know, the hardest question for me that I get is people will say, oh, you just started chemo. Like, what's it doing for you? And it's like, well, I started chemo. I changed my diet. I'm sleeping better. The weather changed. There's like all these different variables. And I, I've also kind of really learned that there is no one to one. Like, yes, chemo might have shrunk my tumors. But it probably was more successful shrinking my tumors because I was eating better. I was eating more fiber, more vegetables. My head was in a better, right? Like it's, so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm babbling and rambling again, but I think that's my answer is that I'll always look into that stuff. There's a great, last thing I'll say, there's a great site called cancerchoices.org. And cancerchoices.org is all about integrative oncology, but it's written towards patients. And they'll go through and they'll do reviews of a keto diet and they'll cite their scientific sources and they'll grade it in a couple of different categories. So I've used them a lot too, because it's a really good resource for figuring out which of these things to try. Um, anyway, sorry, that was a very long rambling answer. Mm. Yeah, you were uh, you were diagnosed the same month I was at the same oh. year. And, and I can tell you, uh, and you've gone through a lot more than I did. Um, but, we all go through our own stuff. But, you know, even now, uh, two years later, I've, if at some point, you know, you just hit the point where it's like, I am so tired of being a patient. <laughs> you know, I, I would like to be able to think about something else for a change. I don't know. How are you holding up? Have you kind of reached that point And are you able to do that? So it's funny, of course, right? I get a shot once every 28 days and I have to go to the hospital to get the shot. I hate feeling like a patient. I hate it. Like it, it's to me feeling like a patient means I'm not independent. I'm not self-sufficient. Like it, it just it brings up triggers me in a lot of ways. One day a month on that 28th day, I feel like a patient because I'm going to the hospital. I'm getting a wristband. I have to have a nurse do the shot. Especially, it's a idiotically thirty thousand dollars shot, right? Like it's it. So that's hard. Um, the rest of the time, I really focus on what I said before. Like I'm not a cancer patient. I'm Bert, I have cancer, you know, neuroendocrine tumors. Somebody told me when I was diagnosed to think of it as a chronic illness. So um, that's helped because I've lived through chronic illness with chronic Lyme disease too. So I, like I, the more I can be myself and do things that keep my mind engaged, the better I feel. Like I'm, I'm trying to get a job, a full-time job right now. Uh, be, and I actually am convinced that even even though I'm not sure yet how that works with my fatigue and upcoming surgeries and all the other type of scuff, stuff, I'm convinced that's going to help my brain so much. So, yeah, yeah like I, I, I honestly, I try to forget about it as much as I can. Yeah, I know. I hear you. I hear that. Thank you. Good luck to you, sir. Of course. Thank you. And you too. All right. Chris Apple, you have a... Comment, question? Yeah, I, and I, I just wanted to comment on the integrative oncology stuff because I'm, I'm, I have looked in the last couple of months a little bit more into this. There is a very interesting talk from um, Lorenzo Cohen from MD Anderson Cancer Center. I yeah. put the link into the chat. Um, he also cites a number of um, benefits for prostate cancer patients. I've recently looked into the benefits for breast cancer because somebody else was asking me in that regard. And there was actually a very exciting paper that I've also put into the chat box. Um, and it says psychological intervention improves survival for breast cancer patients. Um, and, um, and it's actually not only psychological intervention, it's actually uh, a lot of uh, nutritional and physical activity, exercise and lifestyle changes. So it's actually a, a quite impressive paper. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves on the outcomes here, um, you have actually basically, um, if this would be a drug that could be sold with, with IP, this would be a blockbuster, billion dollar drug. Um, this is an effect that is larger than, this is basically the, this is the effect that you get from an immuno-oncology drug if it works on a selected population. This one is broadly applicable, so I just wanted to to comment on that and allude to that. And anybody who's interested can then take a look at that. I, yeah, I mean, I I think it's great. Like, so I so I don't know if anybody lives in California, but the Society for Integrative Oncology has a conference, a, an annual conference. This year, it's in October in Irvine, California. So I'll be there. But it's I went last year. That's why I was went to Glacier because I ultimately went to Banff 
for the conference. And um, integrative ecology conferences, and this just might be my own passion, but it blew me away, right? Because I think, uh, you know, to your point, right? Like no one who's doing research in the integrative oncology world is doing their research to make billions. Like it doesn't exist, right? Like you go see research that's really focused on how do we help people? Uh, and no one's making a lot of money off it. Like I saw this one research presentation that was done where people studied the effect of playing golf on men with advanced prostate cancer. And I mean, not surprisingly, they found out if golf is your passion and you play golf, it's gonna make you feel better, right? Which, but, but just like going to a conference where people are asking questions about that, or like there, you know, there was another study that Lorenzo Cohn was a part of all about hypnotherapy on women who develop pain from breast cancer treatments. Um, it, it was just such an interesting way to think about the world that goes so much in such different directions than the Western oncology world. So, it, you know, I would, uh, I, like I said, it's a soapbox for me, but um, it's it's been really interesting. And I probably learned more and thought differently because of being involved there, certainly than for many of my Western treatments. You know, Thank my you. Western treatments are basically what are the NCCN guidelines? You know, great, we tried this box, let's go to this box. You know, integrative oncology can be a whole bunch of different stuff. So, Rick Davis. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out that integrative oncology um, is really part of the NCCN guidelines now, and the, many of the NCCN comprehensive cancer centers do have um, integrative groups like OSHA, for example, at UCSF and and um and ohsu has now what's important is that most of the treatments they offer are free to cancer patients at that hospital so but as you probably know you you can get you mentioned the cost of acupuncture but you can probably get free acupuncture at the ohsu integrative i've tried so, um, so, really? so ohsu much to my chagrin and this is one of my personal objectives doesn't have an yeah. integrated oncology center they have some services, but they're all disparate and loosely organized. And it's not, they, they're the one major health system on the West Coast without an integrative oncology center. Um, Medicare states that you can only get acupuncture for if you're prescribed with chronic lower back pain. So I got my oncologist to say that one of my symptoms is chronic lower back pain. And then um, uh, OHSU, they have a naturopath who does the acupuncture. So she was about to do it. And then she found out that Medicare wouldn't approve a naturopath performing wow. acupuncture. They'll only, Medicare only reimburses for MDs who perform acupuncture. And I'm sure most people can imagine there's not a lot of those in the world. And mm -hmm. the MDs at OHSU who perform acupuncture, one is an anesthesiologist and one is a neurologist. So they both have full-time jobs that have nothing to do with acupuncture. So, okay. Well, like yeah, I fine. said, we gotta, I gotta connect you with somebody. We'll do it right after this because that, 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 that is really really surprised i mean with the money that ohsu has through yeah. night i i just can't believe that they don't offer that to their patients that's really sad you'd be surprised i'm a big pain yeah. in the ass for them like i'm an i'm an advocate within ohsu i've met a ton of people there i reach out to them all the time about things like this um they're they have amazing people there the institution itself is extremely bureaucratic and yes uh, political and siloed yes, so getting yes, yes. At the level there is really hard at the provider level maybe but their hands yeah. are tied so yeah but okay. uh, i mean i can tell you that for example ucsf uh, i think i'm pretty sure md anderson mskcc mm -hmm. um northwestern um, if you if you need this type of treatment, it's accessible to you through through their integrative centers. Yeah, there's also organizations who will do it for lower income people. Right. Um, so there are some. I actually am about to get a second opinion from MSK in a couple of weeks, which I'm excited about. I know the integrated people there. They have a great integrative oncology group. OK. Um... Chad, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, I know that you have an interest in, we've been talking a lot about it, integrative oncology. Uh, any comments or questions from your perspective? Um, not, not really. I mean, 
the uh, from what I've seen, you know, the ma major medical institutions, you know, I'm at Mayo Integrative Oncology. Uh, you know, they have to have so much data, you know, they have to have so much data to, to, and so I, what I'm finding is that if you go to an integrative hospital, that's not a major institution and they play a lot more and, you know, I'm, I'm just example blocks and one of or some of these, other, I'm just finding, uh, it's just a lot more, you know, I don't know if you're seeing you're breaking up a little bit chad i guess it's the connection um but one of the things i think you said is you need evidence and i just wanted to underline something that bert said before this cancer choices in addition to the questions they'll answer about various treatment options they'll also cite the evidence which you can bring as um ammunition to uh to a doctor to try and and persuade them would you agree, Bert? Yeah, I think that they're good with citing sources for, sor for sure. Um, if you, the Society for Integrative Oncology's website is integrativeonc.org. Um, they have a bunch of stuff posted there too. Uh, there's one of the things that's really helpful on the integrative side is SIO and ASCO do joint guideline development. So um, there have been joint guidelines issued on anxiety and depression and pain and fatigue. And, um, you know, because ASCO and SIO do them together, there's no question on the credibility. There shouldn't be a question anyway, because SIO only does uh, science-backed research or only supports science-backed research. But, um, uh, but the ASCO guidelines, like this is one of the things that's hard for me with SIO is their marketing is horrible. Uh, you know, the we should all know the ASCO guidelines. Like if there are non-pharmacological treatments that have been proven for depression and stress and anxiety, it's like, who wouldn't want to try that before they pop another pill? Sorry, that's my own bias. That might've just come Yeah, back. and I'll just mention, we had a session with Donald Abrams, I think who works on that SIO, um, ASCO. On the original. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. He, he has my favorite quote, cancer is the weed, we need to tend to the garden. He's my favorite IO quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he runs um he he runs the OSHA center at UCSF. Yeah. We're just about at the top of the hour. Uh, I want to give you the final word, Bert. Any any parting words of wisdom? <laughs> if no, no parting words of wisdom. But I would but I would say, um, you know, I can. Uh, put in the chat or if anybody wants it from Brad, like if anybody wants to reach out and talk about anything, just feel free to let me know. Like I'm always, I think one of the things that I've also learned about myself is help is talking to other people and then helping other people really matters. So um, if I can do anything ever, let me know. Like I said, I'm also a marketing guy, so I give marketing advice or uh, health stuff. So 